ladies and gentlemen, can everybody hear me? I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to keep this. Actually, this is going to be a great thing to have for the next uh, for the next few years. Um, so, yeah, actually, we're all going to TED Talk this. Everyone's going to get up and walk around and maybe sing or whatever. So what I'm going to do to start with in this session, it's very much an open session. Nobody has prepared a, a paper or anything. And the idea is that we will reflect on what has been said. But I think more importantly, it will be useful at this point in time to get some audience input because there's been a lot of, you know, really excellent papers. People have had been, you know, to sit and listen to a lot of things, so what we would really appreciate is some fairly brief comments from people that will allow me then to kind of put them to members of the panel. I suppose I should say who is on the panel, though. That would be a useful thing to do. So starting from my left, we have Professor Ursula Kilkelly, who's from UCC, but more importantly, she's from Mayo, and uh, she's also the chair of Oberstown Children's Detention Center, or I probably got the title wrong, but, but that's, she's involved in Oberstown. Beside me is Una Mac Phillips, and Una Mac Phillips is the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Justice and Equality, and I'm particularly grateful to Una for agreeing to take part in a panel like this, because you know, it isn't the normal thing for civil servants ne necessarily to go out into the public square and be, be kind to her, because I know she's, uh, she's worried about this little adventure. And uh, to my right is Alison Kilpatrick. Alison is a barrister, and she previously was the Human Rights Advisor uh, to the Northern Ireland Policing Board, and she wrote a really influential report for the ICCL um, that definitely had a major uh, impact on the thinking of the Commission on the Future of Policing in Ireland. And the reason I know that is that one of the people who was very important in making that report influential was Nolene Blackwell. Uh, Nolene Blackwell is the former CEO of FLAC. She's now the Chief Executive of the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, and she was also a member of the Commission on the Future of Policing. And beside Nolene is my colleague, uh, Professor Siobhan Mullally, who, among other things, is the director of the Irish Centre for Human Rights uh, here in NUI Galway. Now, I haven't done justice to any of their CVs, and all of their biographical details are in the conference pack. But let's see what you have to say, members of the audience. You have ideas. You've heard all sorts of things about human rights, about community policing, about national security and oversight of national security. Um, any thoughts? Anyone want to start us off with a few ideas? Up at the back, yep, the back row there. We have Ben and Kira who are running around with the roving mics. Okay, and we have another here, James Cahill, yeah. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the previous panel speakers, especially Cindy and Maria in relation to their activism, it's, it's, it was very much echoed in their, in their passion, compassion, humility. But I actually, I feel we need to go further than that. And my recommendation would be in the context of the panel now in relation to future policing, especially to look at the ways that we can actually draw in the most vulnerable concepts of our communities, true initiatives, true human rights framework, everything to do from education, going back to the communities, having basically true neighborhood watch initiatives and community alert schemes, being able to reach out to these people. And certainly the likes of Cindy and, and, um, and Maria are very, very, very good practitioners and pioneers in relation to the activism and how to tap into the basic rights as victims of crime in the context of human rights framework to the actual suspects of crimes and to empower people about their rights okay. within the framework, the human rights framework. Yeah, that's very good. And John Topping, I think, addressed that question as well about the connectedness between human rights and community policing, that you can't have one without the other. I'm going to take a few more comments, get a, get a couple of comments going so that we, before we come back to the panel. Anybody else? Uh, sorry, yes. oh, here, James Cahill, yeah. Um, thank you very much. I, I was, my question was very parallel to this, really. Uh, the, the, surely the really tough issue for the uh, gather to deal with in the future uh, revolves around the travelling community, because it involves buy-in also on a big way from the settled community. Um, the travelling community have had a very tough time, and we know, I know as a practitioner, you know, rows that go on within travelling communities, whether it be at funerals or anything else, uh, set a type of stage, and we really don't understand 
uh, many of the elements pushing these areas. Um, if that could be okay, discussed, that's please. A, that's a very useful insight. Anybody else want to come in with something? Yeah. Hi, thanks everyone for coming today. It's been inspiring and very interesting. <coughs> I actually work for Ngarda Siakana and there's been parts of today that have been very difficult to sit through um, and, and hear the feedback parts that have been incredibly negative and I found that going through the Commission on the Future of Policing as well and participating in that. But parts of it have been incredibly honest and inspiring and I suppose it represents the good work that people on Ngarda Siakana are doing every day and across multiple agencies with probation service, the prison service and different government agencies and I suppose from my perspective I wouldn't like any of the good work being done on a daily basis and some of the most visionary and leadership qualities that I see in people every day being lost to some of the negativities that's happening. And I'd, I was wondering from your perspective, were there parts of the implementation document that came out in January that you felt didn't actually represent what came out in the Commission on the Future of Policing? Or is there anything in the, the lead up to that work that you felt didn't transpire across? Because I know we had been at meetings where we felt that some of the recommendations didn't actually tie back to what we thought they originally would. Um, and while the document is brilliant, I think it might have, it could have gone a little bit further. Okay, Any, th th that's a tricky enough question, I think, for, but we, we'll, find, we'll find a way of addressing it. Any, anybody else? Sorry, yeah, okay, yep. Uh, thank you. Um, like the previous speaker, I'm also a member of a Garda Siakona. Uh, Michael Walsh is my name. I'm based here in Galway, the Garda Crime Prevention Officer, and equally it's been, it has been difficult to listen to, to some of the speakers today. Um, I suppose, look, Angarda Shikona is going through reform and change, and I think Marie said earlier, you know, it's welcoming that somebody would actually stand up and say, sorry, we have not been the best, we are trying to be the best, and we are changing. Um, a, a couple of things, I suppose. Um, my work, I suppose, over the years, I have worked with the Irish Human Rights Commission um, in the past. I have done a lot of work with the PSNI. Uh, I do a lot of public order training, and, and Liam, I suppose, earlier down there spoke about public order training, and I'm going to reach out to him. Uh, Cindy, you know, is, is here in Galway, uh, and I'd love to reach out with her and, and try and build bridges, because um, my work on, on a daily basis is, is going around meeting victims of crime. And I think the victims of crime aren't being represented here today. It's out talking to people who, who have been burgled, have been assaulted, have been broken into, whatever it might be, have stuff taken from them. And, you know, our job, I suppose, in the middle is trying to find a balance. You know, and I, I have been a lecturer for many years in the Garda College teaching human rights. Mm -hmm. And it's finding that balance, the balance of, you know, the right between the, the victim and the offender. And I think, you know, very much we're talking about the offender here today and the rights of the offender, but we also have to consider the rights of the victim, and that, that is very important. Uh, and it's, it's, it's something we have to try and do on a daily basis. So I think, uh, you know, if you can remember that, I suppose, as well, that it's, it's that balance, and it's a difficult job. Um, I think a previous speaker this morning said it's a split-second decision, often on a, on, a, on a day or a night. You have two or three seconds to make a split second decision. It's fine to sit here and spend a full day talking about human rights, but um, it's, it's balancing all that. Thank yeah, you. I, I just, just to be clear, though, I think when people are talking about human rights, they're not, not talking about victims' rights. I think that's really, really important to understand, and certainly insofar as the Commission on the Future of Policing dealt with that topic, it was deeply cognizant of the question of victims' rights as much as the rights of accused persons or whatever. So it isn't as binary as you say. It's actually a lot more dimensional than that. But I think the two last points are very, they're very useful and very valuable. We should, we should reflect about that. Una, in relation to this question of the difference between the Commission's report and the implementation plan, any, any thoughts on that? I mean, thinking, I'm thinking also about Liam Herrick's comment earlier about taking the government at face value. You know, that when the government says, right, there's a firm purpose of amendment, we want to change, and the Commissioner wants to change, everybody wants to change. So any thoughts on that kind of idea that that comment as to, you know, difference in emphasis, perhaps, or slight differences between the Commission uh, report and the implementation plan? Um, it's not so much that it comes to mind, to be honest. I'm not aware of any young in here the Commission report and the implementation plan. Like, the government accepted the, the Commission's report in full, hmm. and the implementation plan reflects that. Um, the, the implementation plan is a very practical document and Helen Ryan, who, who's chairing the, the, impl the implementation oversight group, is here today. And it, it's a four-year plan. So it recognizes that something that as detailed and um, as comprehensive and as fundamental as the Commission's report 
can't be implemented in the space of six months or 12 months. It is a four-year plan, and the, the implementation document reflects that, yeah. I think. Nolene, any ideas on the, you know, the question of victims' rights yeah. more generally, just given your work in DRCC? It's, it's interesting, Michael. I, I thought the same myself, that it hadn't actually been mentioned all that much specifically. Um, I take your point, Danica, that it is part of human rights, but I do think there is something I work with the victims of crime, like that's, that's the particular area. And I did wonder, were we going through the day with not enough focus specifically on that area? But what, what I think we came out of it, it did run through the day from Alan Cusack at the start of the day, yeah. where he was talking about the rights of victims of crime, uh, people who had disabilities who were victims of crime, right through there, and, and um, Eilish Barry spoke about, uh, again, people with intellectual disabilities. And one of the things that struck me going through the, the day was right up to where Cindy was talking about where, where men care, discrimination against men care is, is actually so toxic. Uh, it, it struck me that there are a whole lot of vulnerable victims, be they people with intellectual disabilities, be they the victims of particularly difficult crimes like sexual offences, be they um, discriminated groups, and that, in a sense, the professionalised... And, and, and that, the, the, that policing has to deal with those in such a sensitive and professional way. And professional was the, the recommendation out of the commission that struck me most. If we have a truly professional police force, which right. is, I think it was, Liam Herrick used the word neutral, uh, so that is neutral in how it deals with everybody, treating everyone with respect, and treating, so, so victims of crime now of, say, sexual offences or with disabilities are entitled to particular um, uh, assistance. Uh, I think uh, that was, Alan, that was kind of the, the point you were making earlier. And, and, uh, and I think that's really where we're coming. How does um, a policing system actually deal with those particularly vulnerable victims of crime through discrimination or whatever it is? Mm. Um, and, and that's coming up if it is... They have to be trusted. The police have to be trusted. The police have to have the support of other agencies. Again, I was thinking in that last session, I had one day there where I was talking to five different government departments as part of my work, working with and advocating on behalf of the victims of sexual offences. I had justice, I had education, I had health, I had defence, and I had... Uh, oh yeah, and I wrote to the Department of the Taoiseach as well, just, just to, to make sure. But like, that's probably not the most... I then had <coughs> Dublin City Council on the same day and several other organisations as well. So it's such, it's such a complex area um, that I think... You, it's getting all of that understood by the policing system is, is quite complex and that professionalism is what will drive it forward. It's the work you're doing in yeah. the Garda Training College as well. But yeah. on that business of, I didn't actually notice that the implementation plan maybe wasn't That's matching, idea, yeah. but... One of the things that somebody else said today was that it'd be good to have the kind of consultation that happened during the Commission on the Future of Policing, to have it happen again over the course of the implementation. And it's something that those driving forward the implementation might look at, Ms. Phillips and, uh, Mark Phillips and others, uh, is whether, in fact, you could have some sort of ongoing or rolling information sessions or consultation. Well, I think, to the context in which that would occur is in the new local accountability uh, mechanisms, yeah. the new, you know, the, no, the more kind of robust engagement with communities and the coordination of that at a national level by the Policing and Community Oversight Commission. Ursula, on the question of children and juvenile justice, and just generally on that question, Cindy made a lot of references and others made references to, to stop and search and the kind of the, you know, questions of harassment. And if you're looking at kind of the future, the future of policing, the future relationships with the more diverse society and with the various kind of experiences within that society. Any thoughts from your experience as an expert in that area and just from working at the Oberstown Centre as well? You might have some thoughts on that. Powerful uh, 
uh, testimony given to the experience, particularly from a young person's point of view. But I think overall it's not, uh, not wholly evident that we've really grappled with what community policing means from a young person's perspective. What's policing by consent when you're a young person in your community? Uh, the ubiquity of the experience for young people on, on, in many inner city, but also across, across the country, um, uh, of, of encountering uh, police on a daily basis. Um, the importance of policing to young people, not just um, because it is their space, the police and public space is where young people are uh, really living their lives increasingly um, online too, and, and I think that that whole, um, the opportunity that it creates, if we can engage uh, with young people as part of this process, um, it, it lends itself much more to, I think, an intergenerational impact for, for the Commission, uh, a more positive relationship on, a, on a, a longitudinal basis for young people with the police, um, and really gets us beyond this notion of, uh, which I think to an extent the, the, the Commission perhaps fell into the trap of seeing either the young people as only associated with the police when it came to the diversion program, uh, or, or as, as they perhaps the, um, uh, the victims of crime. But also, of course, they're, they're accused, uh, they're perpetrators, they are, uh, in many instances, um, caught up in the criminal justice system in their counties. And so I think the complexity of what young people face when it comes to, to interacting with the police is something we need to really think a little bit more and, um, and work our way through. And, and also then engaging with young people in their communities. And when we talk about community policing and engaging with communities, they're not often formally part of those community structures. Mm. Um, so, so young people are in many ways on the outside, and yet they are a diverse, often complex um, group with their own needs and, and their own um, contribution to make. And I think uh, really looking to see how we might engage more directly with young people through, through the implementation process would be, would be really, really important. Okay. Now, I haven't forgotten Alison and Jamal will come back, but anybody else from the audience want to come in? Yeah, David is here at the front, yeah. That's that's a huge question. Any any other questions or comments? Yeah, uh, Bridge up at the back. Yeah, Bridge Manifold. I know everybody's name. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, no, just Bridge Manifold first. Yeah. You just sorry, Bridge. I don't. Is the mic on? of the force will be dedicated to community policing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I heard reference to 10%, and I think if that's the case, it's, it's laughable because all the initiatives and the recommendations are, are purely wishful thinking. Like, it, was, it seems to me that that percentage should be inverted. I mean, you would have to have yeah, a minimum yeah. of 50% of the force, yep. and that really policing centrally has to be the community as opposed to this sort of add-on. Yeah, no, I mean, they, they, they're, there's a very clear answer to the question. I'm going to bring in Johnny Connolly later on that. I want to get a few more comments in. Um, Mick Feehan as well, yeah? Uh, 
Just on the functions of the Policing and Community Safety Oversight Commission, and it talks about scrutinising policing delivery st and standards and practice in support of professional policing. And I think everybody in the room would buy into the need for that. How confident are the panel about the, the chances of effective performance management within Angarda Siakana? Because, okay, this is the, 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 the Commission will be an external body. I really believe it, it's doomed to fail unless that, the real buy-in and that it is measured, that the metrics are there for members, for management, but me members of Angarda Siakana at all, at all levels that what is planned arrives and is delivered and on the front line. So to me, I think performance appraisal, perf a really effective performance management is going to be a key to the delivery of this within Lingarda Siakana, supported by the work of the Commission. So the question is, how confident are you that that will be delivered within the organisation? Okay, uh, I hate doing this. Josephine, is there any chance you would come in on that point that has just been made by Mick? Because jo Josephine is uh, the chair of the policing authority and an absolute expert on the question of performance measurement and the difficulties, in fact, the challenges in relation to that. Now, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but if you, and if you don't want to talk, that's fine. But if you could, no. it would be a really valuable insight. Uh, th thank you, Tanaka. Um, and I, I just would like to distinguish Mick talked about performance management and you talked about performance measurement. They are not the same thing. Measurement is part of performance management, but there's a huge developmental and management of underperformance piece and all yeah. that. So just to get our sort of terminology uh, clear. Um, how confident am I? Um, I'm more confident than I was uh, two years ago. Um, there's been conversations in the Garda Shia for years about performance management. They have their own language for it. They call it PALF. Um, but that's all there's ever been is <coughs> conversations. So for the first time this year, they have begun to implement stage one for a small proportion of the guards. They, they really need, uh, Mick is right. Uh, so I'm more confident than I would have been, but I would certainly feel that unless there are metrics around that for the commissioner to make sure that performance management systems are put in place for guard the staff who have none and for the other 70% of the guard who, uh, who haven't yet engaged fully with this PALF system. Um, so that's a measurable from the authority's point of view that we place at the commissioner's, if you like, door. And we would measure the rollout of those systems. And we are probably more disappointed. I'm, I'm more optimistic on the Garda side than I would have been. And I'm less optimistic on the Garda staff side. Okay. Because they haven't even begun. Yeah. Uh, despite having commitments and dates. Right. So that, that troubles me. But I think Mick is correct. It's an essential piece of building a professional organization. Yeah. And as part of that, the reason to put the positive side uh, into performance management around development yeah. and learning and professionalizing. So it isn't just about, about uh, measuring in a narrow way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so for that reason, I, I think it's crucially important that it is uh, rolled out um, right across the organization in an intrinsic way yeah. that ties in all of the other functions. That's when we were going around the country, particularly talking to young guards, there was a huge appetite for that whole professional development, career development, but also the idea of, you know, routinized feedback and kind of, you know, development within the job. And it was quite, quite shocking to me the degree to which that didn't exist. Um, it despite, also has the despite potential changes. to be a very positive complementary to the discipline system. There's an yep. over reliance on discipline for managing performance. Absolutely. And it really has the potential to be enormously positive. Yeah. Uh, done well and can break down some of the kind of adversarial ideas. Una, you want to come in on that, I think? Yeah. yeah. I was really struck by when Nick mentioned um, your experience in the private sector of, of performance management and the impact of that when it's done well. And I totally agree with Josephine that the system has to be put in place. It's crucial, though, that the system is meaningful and that it relates to those intrinsic values, to the code of ethics, to the... To the the things that we need to measure, because I think it was a Johnny made the point, somebody made the point earlier about the impact of the kind of data and the importance of data in the US systems. And those kind of measurements can throw up odd kind of consequences because you can impact very significantly on public trust if people are totally 
driven by, by, yeah. the, by the data measurements. I, I don't want to forget David Anderson's point. Again, I know we're hopping about a bit, but this is yes, kind absolutely. of stimulating yeah. Yeah. on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> um, David's point about kind of cyber harm, cyber crime, you know, capacity to yeah. deal with that. Anybody, Alison or Siobhan, do you want to come in on that? Yeah. Uh, just a small point in relation to that. I mean, that's a, a huge issue in relation to human trafficking, for example, and cyber crime and online yeah. recruitment. Um, and that just links back to a, 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 the comment that was made earlier that I, I was a bit surprised that there was a, uh, this sense that there was a neglect of victims' rights when we're talking about human rights and policing, because I see it has been very much at the heart of the, the Commission's report and the implementation report, the focus on partnership in particular, um, and identification of victims of crime and safe reporting pathways and the development of firewalls so that people in undocumented migrant communities in Ireland, for example, um, do find ways to report crime, do feel safe in coming forward. And Cindy spoke about suspect communities um, and the harm that that can have, the impact of that in terms of profiling, but also, of course, in terms of protection of victims' rights. So community policing is absolutely essential to effective um, protection of victims' rights. So I think we need to think we have an undocumented migrant community in Ireland, the Migrant Rights uh, uh, Centre submission to the Commission highlighted about 20 to 25,000 people perhaps, perhaps about five to 6,000 children. Um, and we really need to be thinking about uh, the partnership element that there is there in, in the Commission report. Um, how are we going to engage with the most isolated, those who are constantly in fear of deportation? Are we really thinking about safe reporting mechanisms, uh, about uh, community partnerships that include those who are undocumented, irregular, um, and how to, how to build those, how to develop those over time. And uh, we heard quite a bit this morning about sharpness, you know, um, from the commissioner. Uh, sharpness, uh, emboldening more sharpness. And Flann O'Brien talks about, you know, what you thought was the point was not the point at all. It was only the beginning of the sharpness. Um, so we really need to think about accountability in all different kinds of ways. Um, but what do we mean when we think about accountability in terms of our immigrant communities, newer communities? newer communities and what kind of outreach we're doing, how we are facilitating their participation um, and mm. protection of victims' rights across all kinds of diverse communities. That's excellent. And just on the point of Drew Harris, I haven't forgotten about your point, Breach, but the point of Drew Harris and in Northern Ireland and everything that has been said already, Alison, have you any reactions to that as it relates to Northern Ireland? Everything that has been said. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I also want to go back, though, to the point about victims, <coughs> if I may, because I think it's central to all of this. And it's where Northern Ireland got itself into some mm. difficulty. A narrative was allowed to develop that victims somehow lost out by a human rights approach, instead of the fact that a human rights approach was about victims mm. throughout the whole of the, the approach, both actual victims, potential victims. It was about protection. Uh, it was about all the things that all these um, uh, people have said. So victims are at the heart of it. I think it's very dangerous to allow this they, it, it to be a competitive uh, notion that victims somehow lose out, and it's all about suspects and uh, etc. So I think it's really important to nip that in the bud before it starts. Northern Ireland started to divide down political lines, divided into whether you're four victims or you're four sus suspects, and it was it was um, well, it was a nonsense, but it took hold and it, it was very damaging. Uh, the other thing I'd say about the Commission report versus the implementation plan. This is where I struggled probably the most. Almost all of my reports, and I wrote maybe 15 or 16 of them, were accepted in full. I don't think one re recommendation was rejected. However, when I went back the following year, or two years later, three years later, and I actually asked what was done to implement a recommendation, then the very nature of the recommendation had changed. And what had been implemented was a recommendation they wanted to receive, not the one I'd actually yeah. made. So you really need to look at um, implementation of these reports, not just acceptance of them, and look at the detail of it and follow it through, and follow it through pretty closely uh, and regularly. The other thing I think I learned, um, and it really echoed when I was listening to Marie and Cindy, and I think instead of more people like me, employing people like me or listening to people like me, you need to listen more to people like that and employ people like that, but really value them, pay for them, and support them. I'd love to see Marie 
not just in every district, every area, um, because you're doing a job for policing, and you're doing a job for all those potential victims yeah. out there. Um, but there were lots of good initiatives, and Northern Ireland had lots of good initiatives at a local level, but what happened was they fizzled out. The next new shiny thing came along, and it was developed in a district, and it was um, all the rage for a while until it fizzled out. So nothing was really, lessons weren't learnt, and it wasn't rolled out across the whole of the uh, area. And I think that's a shame. Uh, so you, you've a lot to learn from where I think Northern Ireland went wrong. Yeah. Um, and look at how you can really keep on track once you decide where it is you want to go with all of these things, uh, how you actually push them through. Um, oh. so, I see, Kate, no, but I just, we, we still have the neglected question that Breege asked, and just because you asked specifically about, you know, the proportion, I mean, we, have a, we, we did actually think very carefully about this question, the proportion of guard the time and, and inverting the priority. So, Johnny, if you could briefly just synopsize what the Commission's, because you were probably the most influential person of the Commission on this, if you could synopsize what the Commission's thinking was on that, it um, would be very helpful. Yeah, and it's, then, a, Kate, it's, a, yeah. it's a really important question, and it remains an mm. important question um, what where, where we went with it was we, we, we tossed that back backwards and forwards as to whether we would name you know we would identify a community policing unit and put numbers on it etc and this is impossible to do at the moment there isn't the data there there isn't the demand information there there isn't a coherent work workforce plan and um, and most recently now, the Garda Inspectorate has produced a really detailed and really important piece of work on local policing, where they have got into that, into that level of detail. And so, you know, people talk about percentages, but if you come up with a percentage of, oh, it should be more than 10%, it should be 30%, the question that I would ask is, well, what are the other 70% doing? So we called for role profiles, and we called for the divisional model, a smaller number of divisions supporting the front line. But also we felt that this is something that um, the commissioner must do. It's, it's, his, it's his role and it's his governance function um, that he does that based on information, based on evidence, based on data, based on demand uh, information. Um, and that the, the oversight bodies are, are, what are, are looking at that as well and measuring that. So we, we just didn't want to get into that space because we feared that the overall ethos of community policing might again be marginalised and a, and a unit would be established in each district or in each uh, division. And that, I think, would be a retrograde step because that's the problem mm. that's there now. Okay, yeah. Trying to look at it, then we're trying to say really everyone is a community police, is, is in the community police unless they're not, and that's whether they have sworn powers or not, yeah. uh, and that that's everybody right. is there to serve the community. And I think the model we liked was something like a GP model. Do you know that you go to your GP if you have some sort of hurt and if the GP needs to bring in a consultant for part of the case well then they might do that and the case goes back then to the GP so that the community police person is or people are, are, are serving the whole community for most of the time so, and, and therefore it could change I don't think there was well, we, you were thinking about the GP model that worked um, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Here's a chance to... to yeah, to, uh, Kate yeah. Mulcairns is going bananas to ask a question. Kate's from yeah. Garda Headquarters and she's a lawyer. Well, she's head of legal. You, you've now done my role. But, but, other, but otherwise she's fine. I'm fine. <laughs> um, thank you, Danica. Um, in fact, I wasn't going to ask a question, if only to show some solidarity with Una McPhillips. I felt the need to out myself as um, the head of Garda Legal, surrounded by many colleagues. We're not just grouped in this corner, but there is an element of that. <laughs> and um, I really say that for two reasons. I was struck by an earlier questioner who, who pointed to the fact that neither our minister or our commissioner could stay for the whole day. So I really think it's important to say to everyone here that as a member of the senior leadership team, one of my tasks in staying, and I'm sure I'm speaking for Una too in staying for the entirety of the day, um, is in order to listen. And colleagues to my left have made the point that some of this listening is very difficult and very uncomfortable. Um, 
However, the, the opportunities ordered both by the implementation plan, and I think that's a feature that's been made, by some of the really radical reforms within that plan. And if I have a question, it's not really a question, it's a prompt that I'd be very keen with the gathering of the people on this panel to hear a little bit more about the expansion of the role of Garda Commissioner as a true CEO. Mm. Um, I think that that's something that I would be keen to hear any observations on. But also to take some comfort in, in, in having worked in a number of jurisdictions in the fact that we have one unified police service. We have so many benefits and opportunities because of that that are the envy of my colleagues across the water, where you're looking at 43 last time I lived and worked in that jurisdiction, distinct police services um, within an entity in the UK. So we have so many structural advantages that we can leverage to our advantage here. We have the lessons of history and the cooperation with our colleagues in the PSNI. I welcome the critique in the report, but I believe it always has to be balanced with a commitment of all of us towards supporting Ngarda Shikona. It is the balance of both critical intrusive um, inspection balanced with support, because without that support, the impact upon people, and you've heard some from colleagues, many of whom, um, far from going home at five o'clock, I can just speak to my experience, I've done just a year, just over a year in Angara Shikona, and I worked out very quickly that in every previous busy job I ever had, people went to sleep. So people weren't making work for me while I was having a bit of a sleep. So it's a very different frontline 24-7. I'm not making any exceptionalist comments here, but, um, but to welcome the input of all of the I had the great benefit of going to some of the town hall meetings to observe completely as a non-outed member of Angara Shikona um, the process of the compilation of that report. And I see colleagues, friends, and um, many respected members of this panel here today helping us. And I think it's that focus. It's the, fo help, the help and support focus as well as the intrusive and critical friend. Yeah, well, it's, I think exactly it is the idea of critical friendship that has to be understood. But you've raised the point about the, you know, the the commissioner as a chief executive, and this 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 was, you know, this is a really big uh, this is a big part of the commission's thinking. It required us to think differently about other things. So from that emerged the idea of a board for Angar the uh, and and other knock-on effects. But what influenced me, and I'm just speaking for myself, was the idea that this was an essential uh, change to, a, to change the relationship with the Department of Justice and the involvement of the, the Department of Justice in day-to-day -day, uh, policing issues, which I think is frankly dysfunctional. And I know it's being addressed, but I think it was a real, real concern of ours. It's not that you want to create an all-powerful CEO. The CEO has to be accountable and has to be very accountable, in fact, but also must be supported. There must be some internal uh, support of governance to enable that person to do an extremely difficult job. So on that question, or framing it in that way, in, in that it, it, in a sense, alters the relationship, I think, quite, quite radically with the department. Una, any thoughts on, on, on that? Yeah, uh, just, just before I go there, like, one of the things I want to say is, is thank you again, because like, other colleagues have referred to the, to the discomfort and the... the the, that sense of, of you know being being very challenged by some of the things that have been said today, and I think that's that's the good thing about today because that's what we'll remember. That's what we'll remember when we go back to our desks to actually act and work on this. Is is the challenge that Cindy and Marie and others gave to us today? Do you know that 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 feeling of not being <coughs> comfortable? Um, so just again in in terms of, of the department's history and and, and looking forward and the. The empowering the commissioner to be the true CEO of of the of the organisation, like that, that to me is central to this, and and it's a function of leadership, and it's a function of, of owning the leadership of the organisation, mm. um, 
and that, that's why the practical things that are being done to support that and that are being prioritised in the first bill that will be produced, the, the uh, Policing and Community Safety Bill, which has been worked on at the moment. And there'll be more, there'll definitely be more opportunities for consultation as that's developed. Mm. Um, so those things are important, but that's, that's central to it. I think one of the questions for me throughout the day has been what will be different and what are we doing that's different um, to, to achieve things that have never been, been, been able to be implemented in the past. And I go back to one of the things Liam said earlier about rhetoric won't do it, you know, and like lots of us are attached to rhetoric, you know, and we like, we like a, nice, a nicely written report. And I was reading some of David Anderson's beautifully written reports earlier on in the week. But rhetoric won't do it. We actually have to put our money where our mouth is and our resources where, where we need to, to do the things that we have to achieve. So one of the things that we're doing in the department is, is this massive restructuring, which sounds very kind of you know, bureaucratic and boring, but actually is about putting resources where we ab absolutely have to do things. So like the structure of the Department of Justice is very similar to it would, what it would have been when, when Tim joined it probably in the 1960s. Uh, it, it's bigger and it's, it's got bits bolted on, but it's, it's fundamentally the same as it was in the 1960s. And, and this restructuring will actually put resources into policy making, into legislation, into things that, uh, and allow us to prioritise things. Yeah. Sorry for so, the Tim wants to come in. So, Tim, what was the Department of Justice like in the swinging <laughs> 60s? Um, <laughs> well, it certainly was a swinging. Um, <laughs> I didn't really think it was, actually. It, it began to swing in recent times. Uh, but I can't defend everything that went on in the 1960s. I was only two years of age at that, that time. <laughs> uh, but I do want to come back to, uh, if I may, the question raised by David Anderson about the dark net. Uh, we did give a share of thought to the dark net. And I mean, the reality is that we're well behind the curve on this issue. We're not the only ones behind the curve, even people who are getting up to the curve are having huge problems with it internationally, as you know. But it does constitute one of the greatest threats I think we face, uh, not just from uh, terrorists, but as I said, from organized crime. People who can bring down states, it is an enormous threat. And I think it is something on which the importance of international cooperation can't be overstressed. Uh, we absolutely have to depend on larger jurisdictions with more resources to keep us uh, up to date with this and to help us with the intelligence that is emerging from this. But we did think about it uh, on, in the commission quite a lot. And it is why we did a few things. We recommended the development of a national cybersecurity strategy. Uh, part of our thinking was there was getting people into this space who had the, the talents. We also recommended the uh, security threat analysis uh, service with people with different skills coming in. And the people we were thinking about, amongst others, were people with IT skills. Because you need the very best uh, in the IT world to deal with this new threat. And even the very best are having difficulties with it. And we also recommended as a priority that the Garda Shikana Crime and Intelligence Service should be strengthened. And part of our thinking there also was let's get our hands on experts quickly. Uh, and in fact, we, we described that as a priority. We weren't just thinking about more numbers, we were thinking about expertise, external expertise. And uh, so we did think about it. We came up with a few solutions about, about it, but I would agree it's an area which we're behind the curve and we need, to, uh, we need to get up to it. One other thing that I just wanted to say in response to a comment made by uh, the guard earlier, uh, we were conscious of the fact that, uh, as well as being human rights conscious and, and uh, being, uh, you know, very proper, the Gardaí do have to implement the law as well. And, uh, you know, that it's a quite a difficult job to do both. I think we weren't in doubt, we are never in doubt that the Gardaí had to implement the law. I think our focus was on how all of that is done. And uh, we were focused on that and we were focused on the way in which society itself, uh, I think, needs to be aware of their role in relation to IT, actually, it strikes me that when you go into a restaurant and uh, the child at the table is crying and making a lot of noise, instead of giving him a pencil and a piece of paper, they now hand him an iPad. So uh, we're getting the children into the idea early on that this is where all of life is on an iPad. So I'm not surprised that we have 
problems later on with <coughs> IT and, and radicalization and so on. Thank but, you. But, but we did also say that the guards should all be given iPads as well. Like, you know, just don't, 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 don't. Yeah, don't, but they're, they're grown up. They're, they're, yeah, um, I just, I, 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 I want to be a little bit careful of bringing panelists back in the whole time. I'm still conscious of the audience, if you don't mind. Um, any other, you know, people might have had ideas from earlier sessions that they didn't get to talk about. Just, no, I said, Johnny, I said, not panelists. Um, so anybody want to come in? Yeah, up here, yeah, exactly. And Brendan Flynn, and um, I know I met you and I've forgotten your name, sorry. Hi, uh, Donnie, uh, Matt Island, uh, head of the uh, crime legal section in Garda uh, headquarters. Um, thank you again for, ho for hosting the event. One of the things I would have had, uh, liked to have had an opportunity to hear today um, would have, was um, some discussion around what the role of the police, the Gardaí, in communities should be. Um, we're all familiar with the nine to five role, but at three o'clock in the morning, my experience uh, on a daily basis is trying to deal with legal issues that arise when guards are acting as probation officers, social workers, uh, educators, childminders, you name it, there's a whole range of, uh, of jobs there. Uh, and I'd just like to hear some views from the panel about, um, you know, uh, how expansive should that role be? Um, and is there a need to expand the other agencies of the state that have a nine to five yeah. function there? That, that's actually a really valuable question. I mean, the whole idea of interagency working was huge for the commission, harm prevention, problem solving. Nolan, any, any thoughts on that? I, I wish I remembered it better, but that, that it was one of the things that came out quite quickly was that you have your crime prevention and then all the rest of it. And certainly even in the consultations with guards and the rest of it as well, we, the same thing came across. And the, the reality is that you can't do anything about it. The guards will be out on the street at three o'clock in the morning. They will be the people who have to take somebody to a hospital or to you know, somebody who's, in, who's having a, some sort of a crisis. Uh, there's all the other things that they will have to do the child protection work. And what we definitely saw was the reluctance of all agencies to integrate well or to cooperate well across these various um, uh, issues. So, for instance, yeah. often the Gardaí wouldn't even be able to get hold of a relevant file from some other agency that wasn't at work at three o'clock on a Sunday morning. Um, and so the need for crisis um, groups to come together as necessary and for better interagency work shown by existing processes such as SORUM, which it, while it isn't perfect, is one that deals with sexual offenders across a range of agencies um, and, and other work that's going on in that area. So undoubtedly, I think that's maybe one of the things that was new, newsworthy about the report. And I think the minister picked it up this morning as well. Yep. That recognition and of how much was to do with actually being the public servant on the, who was available yeah. at times when nobody else was. And, and it also was very much the informing kind of principle of the Policing and Community Safety Oversight Commission that these would, you know, there would be crisis intervention teams that you would have, you know, representation of other agencies on that. We did a lot of work with people like Ruth Barrington who understand that system really well. And it is a huge, I mean, it's a huge issue, a huge cause of sympathy for us with the guards, to be perfectly honest, because of the kind of extent or the degree to which problems can get very, you know, dumped on uh, the Shiakana, particularly at certain times of the week, and because it's the one 24-7 service. So it was, I mean, we know it's not an easy thing to fix, but it's very, very much in the thinking of the Commission in recommending the new uh, horribly named PC SOC. Um, and, and in fact, Donica, didn't you say in the report that, that actually there needs to be legislation yeah. where other agencies have to recognise their obligations yeah. as well to cooperate with the Gardaí, because the Gardaí have obligations to cooperate with other agencies, but there isn't always the, the, the opposite uh, requirement, so yeah. yeah. To, to Tulsa mm. in the yeah. reports, yeah. yeah. And if we go back to the mid 2000s when we had um, high numbers of unaccompanied and separated children going missing in Ireland, one of the key problems was that you didn't have social workers available over the weekend mm. or in the evenings and no proper accommodation on that. So uh, that was something that I was very happy to see in the reports. Yeah. yeah. Brent, Brendan Flynn, you, he said his hand up as well there for a while. Hello. Um, 
I want to ask a question about the National Security Analysis Centre. Will it, as uh, Arthisha suggests, coordinate intelligence, not just domestically between the Defence Forces and Angarda Siakona, but also with um, other countries and their intelligence services? And if it will coordinate and it's a range of intelligence with those um, other countries and, and those other agencies, how do you mainstream human rights protection, striking the balance between protecting, say, individual citizens in this jurisdiction and their, their rights and freedoms versus the prevention of very grievous offences in potentially other jurisdictions, not just EU jurisdictions. So I just wondered, you know, what level of coordination is involved and then what level of protection can be deployed realistically? I mean, j just to be brief in answering that, we, that, that level of detail didn't, wasn't gone into by the, the, the Commission, except to say that what we recommended should have the similar level of independent oversight as exists in the UK, the independent reviewer there, the independent examiner here, uh, within the, the, the framework of, you know, the appropriate balance within the rule of law. But, I mean, the kind of the transnational dimension of that is definitely um, complicated. David, do you want to say anything about that or how that, that operates in practice, you know, where you already have this, this system? Because, you know, we just simply don't have that yet. Well, we were stung very badly in the early years of the so-called war on terror when uh, we shared information we shouldn't have shared because it ended up in torture chambers. And we're still seeing the consequence, consequences of that in the courts. Um, and we had a, a two-part judicial inquiry that never got, never got beyond its first part. Uh, however, I think the main thing that was needed to put it right, we have done, we did it in 2010, and that was the introduction of a public document called the Consolidated Guidance, which tries to set out the principles that should apply when you're deciding whether to share an item of intelligence with a foreign intelligence service. Not saying that's cracked the problem, but it's certainly given us a framework within which the problem can be addressed. And I would say it's no good just relying on ad hoc review. I think you need uh, guidelines as well in black and white, probably approved by, by your parliament, um, okay. so that everyone knows where they are. One or two last comments, and then I'm going to um, come back to the panelists. So Maeve up there, Maeve O'Rourke. I have a couple of questions for Alison, bearing in mind your experience as a barrister in both um, England and Northern Ireland. Um, I was struck by the commissioner saying earlier that when he was with the PSNI, he found the jurisprudence extremely helpful. It got him out of many a difficult situation, shone a light on the path he should take. And then later on, Mr. Anderson mentioned how his work has been used in court cases in the UK. And I'm wondering, in your research for the ICCL, um, did you get a sense of where we're lacking or access to the courts in Ireland, whether that's a big issue, whether we are lacking the type of jurisprudence that the commissioner was relying on, that we see people um, you know, taking cases to achieve in England, and whether you have views on what can be done to uh, further access to the courts in Ireland so that where there are really tricky and maybe systemic issues, that jurisprudence can be given. Um, and then my other question is in relation to the guards being involved in prosecuting. It was a recommendation of the commission yeah. that on Garda Siakana should be taken completely out of prosecuting, where they do a lot of it in the district court, but in general they should be taken out. So I would love just to know from the members of the commissioner in general, whether people think that will actually eventually happen, and maybe Alison, whether you have views on why that is important and whether it's urgent given your research. Um, talked, I thought very generously about how the work that other people did influenced his decision making, and he was talking, I think, in a very practical basis. So, three o'clock in the morning, Ardor and Shop France, what on earth does a uh, gold commander do? If a child of 10 is in the firing line of a gunman and there's a, a, a car burning and a police officer at risk. So he genuinely did think through the human rights implications of every aspect of that because I saw uh, police officers do it and I saw them do it under pressure without any time to consider me or um, uh, what, what I might say in a report. Very, it wasn't very often though that I heard case law being discussed because the case law was written into the guidance at that. So we didn't Police officers don't need to be legal experts, but they need to intuitively know how to apply the law. And I think that's, that's where a lot of this goes wrong. We don't make it operational or scenario-based. We just talk about sort of highfalutin human rights, which is wonderful, and everyone would agree with it. But ask a police officer what that means 
at the Ardoin shop fronts at three in the morning, and that's a wee bit more tricky. Yeah. The case law, however, um, was useful for people like me writing reports um, uh, and developing, helping them develop guidance. And there was case law. There was case law primarily in GB, which I was able to use in my work with the PSNI. There was some case law in Northern Ireland, which I was able to use in the ICCL report. I really struggled to find any jurisprudence in the Republic of Ireland that I could use. And it really troubled me. And I thought I was using the wrong database. I thought it was my search terms were all wrong. And the more people I spoke to, the more I realized I wasn't going to find any cases because there really weren't any. They're few and far between. And when I asked about why, I wondered whether that was the lawyers just not engaging uh, with those sort of cases. I heard that you don't get paid for them. There's no legal aid really available for human rights cases, which was a further shock, but explained a lot. So I think you need to have legal aid uh, to enable people to um, employ lawyers to uh, claim their rights or to defend themselves if their rights have been breached in a criminal trial, for example. Uh, the fact that that's not available is quite, um, well, it's, it, 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 frankly, it's quite shocking. And you can have all the structural changes, all the legal changes you like in Ireland, and you can have the best police force in the world. But if people aren't able to litigate potential breaches of their rights, then we're, we're not going to find out. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a real okay. concern. Now, I'm just, you know, to kind of round things off, I want to, one of the things that kind of strikes me about today or a day like today, look, the, a, there's a lot of emphasis about how, how long it takes to achieve change, you know, that everybody, realizes the depth of the problems and the extensive nature of the problems and how intractable they may seem. There are questions of trust. You know, do people trust the government to do what they say they will do or do they trust the commissioner to stay good and all of these kind of things. So I'd like maybe just to finish off to ask each of the panelists to reflect on this kind of idea of a achieving radical change over time. And I'm you know, honestly talking probably longer than four years, and also the idea of trying to achieve change that becomes irreversible, because I think one of the difficulties from experiences is that you achieve a certain amount of change and then things go, go back again. So Ursula, do you want to kind of give us some thoughts on that, even just you know, reflecting on your own experiences where this might or might not be, you know, is there a case for optimism, I suppose is what I'm saying. Management to take 
Okay. Una, any thoughts on this general question? Loads. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's pretty we haven't got another couple of hours, actually. I know, it's it, not it, really. It does. <laughs> <laughs> your, your people points. Um, like, it does come down to, to changing the culture, but in order to change the culture, we are going to have to invest in the systems and the structures. Like, we, we have tended, and we have lots of good people, um, but, but the the consistency of that around the country. Mm. So, you know, the public have a right to expect the same policing service, whether they're in Donegal or in, in uh, the North Inner City, or whether, you know, whether they live in Dublin 1 or a mile away where I live in Dublin 9. Uh, you know, it, it should be the same policing service everywhere. So the consistency of that and mm. the application of that through systems and structures in a consistent way around the country. So I would be optimistic because I think that recognition is there now. You know? But you don't want to lose the structured informalism no. that Mick Feehan was talking and about. And you don't want to lose the honest dialogue that we're getting yeah. to as well. So like, we do rely on people to deliver those things. Yeah. The, the performance management is part of that. The IT is part of that in terms of, of the kind of discipline that that can bring to, to matters as well. Yeah. You know? So I would be optimistic. Uh, Alison, again. Systems and structures, I always wonder whether they should come first or whether actually they should be informed by what comes out of the cultural change and the um, mindset change and the policy direction. Mm. Once that's really settled upon, then you can look at what structures really are f tailored to meet that. Um, I, I would favour getting the cultural change, deciding what it is you really want to achieve, and then fit everything else in around it, as opposed mm. to the other way around, where you fit everything into the structures and uh, that you've um, already created. Okay, Nolene. Um, I I'm t I remember is, is it in the forward to the report that uh, that Kathleen O'Toole says. Um, people ask, why will this be different? Why why will it go forward? And I think the answer was something like it's it's too important or it can't go on like it is now so it's mm. too important so that's the that I, I suppose if there's enough sense from the community that it's really important that things were not going well for uh, for our policing system which is bigger than on Garda Síochána if if the people remember that and Again, it's the, it's the question, what's the balance between systems and culture? Because every time we looked at systems, somebody said, well, the culture has to change as well. And then when you looked at culture, somebody said, well, the systems have to be in place. So it's the systems and the culture. I think the two have to go together. The systems is, is up to Una, her colleagues, and uh, I think the politicians to make sure that every, the framework is there. And the leadership is then needed from uh, Angarda Siakona and others to, to drive the culture change. And then, as somebody said to me in the ladies, which is where the really important conversations <laughs> happen at a conference like this, uh, what about the budget? If the budget isn't behind it, if the costings don't come, it won't happen. Yeah. Yeah. Just Alison wants to say a quick word before Siobhan, yeah? The I was not convinced um, that everyone believed that policing had to change, and I'm talking about um, the Gardaí themselves, yeah. and I'm talking about people within government. So I'm not sure we can sit back and say, everyone's agreed it all has to change, yeah. Yeah. and therefore get our systems and our structures in place. Okay, that was a sloppy talk in my no, 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 because everyone on the commission agreed, <laughs> you know, yeah. but and I, what we heard from the consultation. All, all I was yeah. going to add was, yeah. in, this happened in relation to, it came up time again in relation to my experience oh, in Northern yeah. Ireland, and lots of people would say, yeah, it's lovely to meet you, you did, I'm sure you did smashing work, but it's completely different up there. Yeah. There is no resemblance. So anything you have to say does not uh, apply down here. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, you know, change was needed in the north, oh, but yeah. it's wanted here. Yep. And I you think won't. that is a fundamental mi yeah. mistake going yep. forward. And uh, I think and that really comes, um, mm -hmm. touches uh, on, on what I wanted to say, is to go back to Cindy's point also around the levels of trust in Angarda Síochána being quite high in Ireland. Um, but not necessarily in all communities. Um, and I think we have to think about accountability to whom and to ensure that it's accountability to all communities and to different groups within those communities. Um, and cultural change won't be enough because that's always going to be dependent on the happenstance of which, who's there at that particular moment in time, um, who, who you get on the phone. Um, that, that, it, it, it's too susceptible to change, so we absolutely need the structures, the systems for oversight, 
uh, and accountability, and that requires a robust civil society, which we do have in Ireland, but we can't take for granted. I mean, civil society has been under threat. Um, there are problems around resourcing and funding, um, and that will be essential to ongoing accountability and cultural change. And we also need visibility and transparency <coughs> and data um, by which we can measure and monitor what is happening, which at the moment we don't have enough of. Excellent. And just to conclude, I mean, this morning when the president opened the conference, he spoke about the, the purpose of a university in these kind of settings, how the university can become the public square and that, you know, as a public institution, we have, in fact, a moral obligation to, to engage in this way. And I think today has been a really fine example of that. I mean, it's really, you're always worried about these things when you're doing them, that, but then when they turn out to be as good as this, it's really, really worthwhile and it's really um, an honor to have, um, to have been involved. And the, the event was uh, co-hosted by the School of Law and the Irish Centre for Human Rights, which I think is a wonderful collaboration. And my colleagues, uh, Sandra Glennon and Lorna Cormican, were uh, particularly helpful in relation to organising this. We got funding, uh, which made things a lot easier, from the Department of Justice and Equality. And we're very, very grateful for that funding. I think it was um, really good to have that. And again, an indication, I think, of a, of a degree of seriousness on the part of the department that they want to be involved um, collaboratively in this, in this endeavor to keep the discussion going about police reform. Um, I'd like to thank Lisa and Darren, who have done extraordinary work um, translating everything, because we've had a real range of speakers, um, a range of speeds of speakers as well. Um, you know, so I'm going kind of slowly. And, <clears throat> and they, they obliged us at, at somewhat short notice because we were very keen to ensure that the live stream would be accessible to the deaf community or the non-hearing community and, and I think that's again, again just a great, a great service and we're extremely grateful for that. Um, our great friend Cormac Staunton, who did the audiovisual with his colleague, whose name I don't actually know, sorry, Parker, yeah, and did amazing work um, for us today, has done, has done amazing work for us loads of times, put together all sorts of things here to hide the, the plain wall and even got us purple lights, which was uh, warmed the place up a bit, even though some people didn't think it really warmed it up. Um, Angus McMahon, who did our photography and is the best airbrusher in the west of Ireland. Um, our caterers, our master chef, NUIG, and um, two wonderful helper, helpers, Ben and Kira, uh, from our student community who have been just, I mean, absolutely wonderful. Everybody should have two helpers. It's a great thing to, ha to have two helpers for a day. It's, I, I could really get used to this, but uh, they're both extremely obliging and great fun to work with, and they did an extraordinary job. So thank you very much as well for, for all that you did. And I suppose finally, uh, we should thank the speakers and uh, the chairs and the respondents. I think we had, you know, every single person who spoke here today was really excellent and all excellent in really different ways. That, that's what really struck me was that people could be, you know, incredibly good in one kind of technical respect and somebody else is incredibly emotionally powerful or whatever. That We really got that balance of just real, really, really wonderful, brilliant speakers. And I'm extremely grateful to them because I think it's very powerful uh, to have that level of of advocacy and that level of 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 speech at an event like this, you very it was very easy. But um, so the, the final the, the, every by the way everybody that was asked said yes, which was really good. I mean that's always a really good sign when you're organising something, and you will be rewarded adequately tonight when we give you. Um, We'll give you a nice little meal, and I'll buy a few people <laughs> a few drinks. <laughs> but uh, the last, I know, uh, <laughs> I know, but the last, uh, just two points to make is that we will be producing a report. Myself and Dr. Leonard Taylor, who's a graduate of the Irish Centre for Human Rights, will be producing a report from this event. We've, that's one of the reasons we've been recording it and taking photographs and everything. So we will have. Uh, a report that will be there as a kind of an enduring contribution to this uh, discussion. And my colleague, Mabel Rourke from the Irish Centre for Human Rights is also doing a podcast of this event. So if you've been speaking wrongly out at the reception, she may have been going around with her microphone recording it. Um, no, I'm sure she hasn't. But she will be doing a podcast with this as well, which is part of a new podcast series that she's starting uh, in the Centre for Human Rights. Maeve has just joined the centre and it's great, it's great to have her in the, as a colleague in the university. So. Um, for those of you who want to go on a, on a short historical tour of Galway, 
if you've never been here before, and in the middle of Storm Hannah to give it a kind of an added bit of atmosphere. Um, we have arranged one. Um, a lot of the speakers have been making excuses about ailments and things that they can't go on. So I, I'm going on the tour anyway, because I, I want to find out about the place that I've lived in since 1985. And uh, lots happened before then, I believe. Um, so we're, we're, we're starting, I think, just from outside. Uh, Anne Carey is her name. And if you'd like to join us for that stroll, it'll only take about an hour. It might be of interest or a bit of fun. And thank, thank you all for coming. Cool.